Hey guys, this is my second creepy pasta ever made, and it took me hours and hours upon editing. Yep, I mean, really, I really hope you guys like it. And also, to make this, if you want this actually to be scary, I suggest listening to it at night in the dark alone. But. With further ado, I give you the lady under the house. In Andover, Connecticut, in the year 1935, lived a woman by the name of Miss Pickett who gave abortions to various women across the city. Around this time in the US, abortions were illegal and had to be done in private. They were also done in the most inhumane, unsanitary way. The abortions were done by heating a metal hanger and yanking the baby out of a woman's body. Some women died from the procedure. Some, however, lived on a normal, happy life without worrying about the pregnancy. Miss Beckett became well known around the town for her work. Each and every week, she would get someone new that would come to her house asking for an abortion. Some women would come with their husband to give them comfort during their procedure. Some women would come alone in fear of their husbands soon finding out that they had an affair with them, or frightened that their husbands would find out that they aborted their future child and beat them to death. As the word got out about Miss Pickett aborting more and more babies, the men that wanted future children found out about her abortions because of their wives' suspicious behavior. The men all got together and elaborated a plan to beat the woman to death for ruining their future family. The leader of the group was a man named Tom Bailey. During the night of Miss Pickett's death, the men all met at Tom's house. Okay man, we all have one goal tonight, to beat that damn woman to death. The men all shouted with a victorious yell and headed out to Miss Pickett's. On October 1st at 10 p.m., Miss Pickett heard loud shouting outside of her house. When she looked outside of her room window, she saw a group of 30 men with torches outside of her house. One of them then began shouting her name. Come outside of the house, Pickett. We just want to talk. A few men had laughed in an evil way. Get out now, slut. I'm going to tear you to shreds for ruining my family and killing my future child. Miss Pickett immediately knew what the man was talking about. She then heard banging on the front door. When she looked outside, she saw four large men banging a large log on her door, which then began to crack. Miss Pickett immediately ran downstairs into her living room and went into her fireplace, opened a hatch that was hidden under it, and went inside, locking it back. Miss Pickett heard the door bust open and large footsteps on top of her. Where the hell is she at? Damn it, she deserved to pay for her crime. Just leave it be, Tom. She probably ran out the back door when she saw us, but she deserves to pay, John. Tom! We'll get the witch next time. The footsteps then began to fade away. As they did, Miss Pickett relaxed. All of a sudden, she heard crying. At first, it was faint, then began to come louder. She then began to feel small hands the size of a rat's hand crawling. She caught on her light, and what she saw terrified her. There were small fetuses crawling all around her. It looked like they were hundreds. They were all the babies that she aborted in the past years. But how, she thought, they were all dead. They then began to crawl all over, surrounding her entire body, then crawling into her mouth, suffocating her to the death. My family and I recently moved up to Andover, Connecticut. It is the end of October and the year is 2015. My dad has just gotten a promotion in his company. So we all had to move here to the location of his job. I miss my old home already and I miss my family. But most of all, I miss my friends. Ugh, a new school here. That's some lame old local town. Just what I wanted, Dad. Thanks a lot. You'll make new friends, Johnny, don't worry. And plus, I think you'll like this new place. Yeah, honey. This place is beautiful and it's right by the lake so you could go fishing. Sure, mom. We all pulled up to the house around 12 p.m. 
and began unloading our car. As soon as I got in, I decided to choose my room before my dumb sister chooses first. When I got upstairs, I saw four bedrooms in the bathroom. I looked in each of them. None of them satisfied me until I saw a hatch that led to the attic. I pulled the drawstring and began climbing. The attic immediately caught my attention. Dark, quiet is what I liked, and this fit the exact qualifications. As I looked around, I began to unpack my bags and settle down. I peered to my left and seen a window that was above a cabinet. When I looked out, I realized the view was absolutely amazing. It was a view of the lake in the back of the house. This place must be a fortune, I thought. Johnny, come help us finish unpacking, my mom had called. Okay, coming. When we all finished unpacking, my mom began to prepare dinner. My favorite. Roast beef and creamy mashed potatoes, smothered in gravy. After dinner, we all gathered in the living room to watch some TV, and then we all prepared for bed. That night, I couldn't get any sleep at all because of the thoughts of running through my head about going to my new school tomorrow. I'd be starting out the beginning of my senior year without any friends. I mean, how amazing is that? The greatest year of high school, and I'd be a miserable loser. As my mom dropped me off at school next morning, at Bolton High, I seen how dry and boring the place looked. My first class, of course, was the most boring of all, history. My teacher's name was Mr. Paninsky. He rumbled on and on about the history of his dumb town. The rest of the day was a bore, and then lunch came around. Yup, you guessed it right. I sat alone, didn't even bother asking is anyone sitting here, just to have them lie and say yeah there is, when there actually isn't. You've seen how the movies play out, the new guy comes to new school and sits alone at lunch. So damn cliche. Anyways, like I was saying, the whole day was a total bore fest until my last period, that is, which was science. When I walked in class, I went straight to the back. When the bell rang, this girl walked in. She looked amazing. Her emerald green eyes and jet black hair matched perfectly with her light caramel skin. I hadn't realized I wandered off until I heard the teacher yell for me. Excuse me, young man. Oh, sorry. What is your name? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Johnny. I just moved up here yesterday from Daytona, Florida. Oh, that's nice. Well, welcome to our school, John. Thanks, I guess. My mind then began to doze off again. As I heard the teacher lecturing on and on about some boring science, the bell then rang. Before I knew it, school was over and I was back on my way home. My mom had stopped at the store and told me to go inside real quick and pick up some dinner for the night. When I got in the store to pick up the food for dinner, I went to the front to complete my purchase and what I saw caught my attention. It was that girl I saw last period. Hey, oh hey, aren't you that new guy at school? Johnny, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> that's it. And what's yours? Ashley, hey, you seem like a cool guy. Do you have any plans this Friday? Uh, no, not really. Well, my friends and I are going to the big football game, and I was thinking you should come with us. Sure, that sounds great. I noticed the overexcitement in my voice. I mean, sure, that sounds fun. We'll meet back up here on Friday around 7. Okay, thanks. Hey, what's your number? She asked. My heart began to beat fast. Holy shit. I haven't even been in this town for a full week and some beautiful girl already runs my number. This place may not be that bad after all. 
It's 479-067-4322. Okay, I'll give you a text tonight. All right, thanks. When we arrived home, my mom began to make dinner while I went to my room to lay back down and listen to some music. My sister Sasha came into my room, interrupting my chill time. What do you want, loser? Mom says dinner is ready. Okay, now you can you please leave my room? Whatever, Johnny. During dinner, my dad started up the conversation as he usually does. So, Johnny, how was school? You getting the girls' numbers? No, Dad. I was only there for like eight hours. Ha ha. If I was you, I would have been got some tender on these numbers. You ain't got it like your old man, Joe. Now, you know I was the only girl you had in high school. Don't show up in front of your son. My dad then began to laugh. Whatever, Nicole. Well, how was your day, baby? My dad had asked Sasha. It was okay, Daddy. No boys ain't trying to talk to you, right? Remember, you ain't allowed to have a boyfriend. Daddy, no. Sasha laughed. After dinner, we did what we usually do every night. And guess what that is? Yep, watch TV. And surprisingly, it never bothered me. When I went to bed, I checked my phone, and to my surprise, Ashley actually messaged me. I honestly expected her to forget or just simply delete my number from her phone. She said, hey, this is Ashley, and no, I did not forget to text you. I replied back, wow, well, I already knew you couldn't handle me, not texting me. I'm irresistible. She seemed to have found that funny and sent the kiss emoji, saying you're funny as fuck. I didn't know whether to detect it as a flirt or just her being a girl. We began to talk about where I'm from, why I moved, and about the school. Our conversation lasted for a while, which surprised me. When Ashley had said goodnight and went to bed, I realized it was 3 a.m. Wow, I thought to myself, she might just actually be into me, or might just be as well. A few hours later, I was at school, and then lunch came around. And to my surprise, Ashley was there sitting with some people I assumed to be her friends. She then wavered for me to come over. As I sat, her friends then began to laugh. So this is him, Ashley? Ashley then looked at her train in embarrassment. I saw her cheeks begin to blush. She then said, shut up, guys, laughing at them. The two girls then got up and said, well, I'll leave you two alone. There was an awkward silence. It then was interrupted by me asking, about the game. The bell then has suddenly rung. The rest of the day was long until science. Ashley walked in class late, smiled at me, and waved. That brightened up my day. When I got home, I texted Ashley immediately, talking to her and asking her about her day. It's a shame. I honestly think I'm falling for her. And I've only known of her existence for two days. My mom called me down for dinner and when we, were, when we were finished eating, we all sat in the living room. Sasha then said, it's cold. Can we please use the fireplace? My dad said yes and told me to clean out the fireplace while he got the wood. As I cleaned out the fireplace, I noticed a hidden hatch. What the? My dad then came in with the wood. Hey, dad, come check this out. The hatch was rusted and looked old. My dad put on it and began to come loose. Johnny, come help me out. We both pulled on it and it finally came off. My dad then told me to get the flashlight. When I came back down, I peered inside the hole. It was extremely dark. I saw ladders leading down into the tunnel. The real estate agent never told me about this. So my dad climbed down the ladder, I followed him. I flashed light around us. It looked like a small storage room. I then saw a shelf full of what appeared to be jars of jam. As I got closer, my heart sunk. Dad, come over here now. My dad and I saw jars of bloody fetuses. I then looked to the left of us and saw a surgical table with hangers scattered everywhere. What the hell? Is everything okay down there, my mom Max? Yes, Nicole, just give us a sec. We're coming back up. When we got back up, my dad explained what we saw, and my mother began to give a terrified look, as well as my sister. 
We closed the hatch and decided to never speak on it again. That night I could say I did not sleep well, same as everyone else. Around 3 a.m. I awoke to the sound of a baby crying. The sound was coming from the living room. I cut on my phone's flashlight and went downstairs into the living room. And what I saw made me freeze. It was a fetus laying in the middle of the room. I backed away slowly and bumped into something. My heart sank into my chest so low I thought it was going to die at the moment. When I turned around, I saw a lady in a white gown staring at me. Fetus began to crawl out of her mouth. I let out a scream so loud it woke my family. My dad came rushing downstairs to see what the problem was. When I told him, he just said, I was probably just imagining just because of what I saw earlier under the house. My mom, however, believed me. She was into that kind of stuff, but my father, of course, didn't. Stereotypical dad. I never went back to sleep. When I got to school, I couldn't pay attention to class. At lunch, when Ashley and I talked, she noticed I wasn't fully there. What's wrong, Johnny? Well, last night at my house, I saw something I never wish I saw. What do you mean? Last night in my living room, my dad and I discovered a hatch underneath the fireplace. When we climbed down there, in it we saw. You saw what? We saw a shelf of fetuses stacked on top of shelves. No, there was about a hundred of them. And when I went to sleep that night, I woke up like around 3 a.m. Because I heard crying coming from the living room. When I went downstairs, there was this fetus just laying in front of the floor. And when I turned around to go back upstairs, there was this lady just staring at me. Fetuses were crawling out of her fucking mouth. Ashley then spoke up. I don't know what to say, John. That's terrible. Well, I'm surprised you even believe me. My dad didn't. Trust me, Johnny. When I hear shit like this, I don't take it as a joke. Thanks for listening. The bell then rang, indicating next class to start. The rest of the day was a drag. Ashley unfortunately didn't make it to class. How great. My mom sent me a text telling me to walk home. That just made my day even better. When I finally got home, I seen no one was there. I just decided to go fishing. The lake looked better up close. Pulling up my fishing boat into the water, I paddled off into the deep abyss. Three hours into fishing, I caught about six catfish, my favorite. I decided to call it a night and go back in. When I was paddling back to shore, I looked at my attic window and saw the same lady from last night staring at me. The sight of that caused me to jump in with fear and fall into the water. As I swam back up to the surface, I looked up at the window and to my surprise, no one was there. When I got back into the house and my mom was preparing dinner, why are you so wet, John? Did you fall in the lake? Are you okay? Mom, I'm fine. Okay, dinner is almost ready. I'm really not that hungry right now, but thanks. As soon as I took a shower, I went straight to bed. It was about 3 a.m. when I awoke to my mom screaming. Sasha and I rushed to the room. My dad was already there trying to comfort her. My mom had told us she felt someone reaching between her crotch with something hot and sharp. Joe, we have to leave this place now. Listen, all of you guys are just having nightmares. It'll all be okay in the morning. They then began to argue. Sasha and I followed in as well. During all of our yelling, we began to hear a loud bang come from the living room. We all immediately rushed downstairs and saw the hatch under the fireplace open in the corner of the living room. There was the lady. We all heard scattering and there was hundreds of fetuses crawling all around the house towards us. The woman then turned around and looked straight at us and opened her mouth wide, letting out a scream. More and more fetuses began to crawl out of her mouth. My family and I rushed out of the house and drove away to the motel. My dad then called a priest by the name of Father John to perform an exorcist on the house. I didn't go to school the next day. Ashley had sent me a text asking if I'm okay. I of course replied yeah. 
My dad had drove us all to the priest's house. Luckily, he was local and lived about five minutes away from the motel that we slept in the night. When we got there, we all explained everything that had happened. Oh my, he answered. Follow me to my office. As we all got into his office, he began to pull out files. 20 years back, a family of four, just like you, lived in that house. They all heard the crying of a baby one night and all decided to move out the next day after. When that house was first built, a lady by the name of Miss Pickett lived there. It dates all the way back to the 1935. My grandmother was just a young girl at the time and she would always remember people going to Miss Pickett's house to get abortions. One night in October, a group of men decided to beat her to death for aborting their future children, but when they all got there, she was gone. Some say she fled the town. Some say she just went to her cousin's house forever hiding her identity. We saw what was under the fireplace and trust me, it ain't pretty, my father had said. There were jars of fetuses everywhere. Well, the story is true then. Miss Pickett did die under the house, and I'm afraid you unleashed her spirit into your home. The room was quiet for a few seconds. Well, father, can you help us? The mother asked, but it in. Yes, I can. I'll gather up my two brothers who are priests as well. For a spirit that has been trapped for 80 years, it is unhappy and quite strong, and I need all the help I can get. We all agreed to meet back up at our house at nine that night. When I walked in, the house felt cold and dark. Where does the spirit usually reside? One of the pastors had asked me. The living room, I replied. When we got into the living room, the three men said, okay, now let's begin. They then began to chant Bible verses. All of a sudden, I heard thunder crackling outside. When the hatch from under the fireplace had bust open, Miss Pickett emerged from the hole levitating and screaming loud. It sounded like she was in pain. Thunder then became louder. Strong currents of wind were blowing all around the house, breaking tree branches that then fell into the house, breaking windows. The birds that I thought went south for the winter were furiously flying around the house and through the cracked window. Fetuses began to crawl out of the hole surrounding the whole room. Miss Pickett remained screaming in pain, and suddenly she waved her hands towards the tree passes, causing the fetuses to crawl towards them in a fast pace. They all tried to dodge, but two of them were attacked and went down. Fetuses were covering their entire body, suffocating them, crawling to their mouths. Father John was the only one standing. He called for us to help him battle the strong spirit. My father and I joined in unison with Father John reciting Bible verses. Miss Pickett screamed louder and louder as we chanted on the, the fetuses began pouring out of her mouth. There were hundreds, no thousands, blowing out of her body, crawling to all of us. The house then began to shake violently, cracking the walls and windows. The spirit is too strong, my father said. We must keep going, Father John shouted. The wind became stronger, breaking parts of the house. Glass and plywood were flying everywhere. A large piece of glass had slit Father John's throat, causing him to violently choke on his own blood. We have to get out of here now, my father had shouted, as we all tried to run out of the house. The front door shut violently. We all turned around and saw the lady nearly three feet from us. What do you want from us? My father had asked. For your souls to live with me for eternity underneath the house. All of a sudden, my vision went black. I awoke in a hospital room. Oh, you're finally up. A doctor had then begun walking to me. What? Where am I? You're in the hospital, of course. We found you in your home with a large piece of plywood on top of your head. What are you talking about? Where is my family? <sighs> I'm sorry, son. But they were all found dead. What are you talking about? I was just with them last night. I didn't have remembered the events that had happened last night. How did they die? They were found in the living room. Their cause of death was suffocation of toxic gas. This can't be. There was this lady in my house. There, there were thousands of fetuses. How did you not see them? They were trying to kill us. Son, I'm sorry, but if you keep talking like that, we'll have to put you in a psych ward. 
that night in the hospital room. I couldn't sleep. I have no reason to live. My family is dead and no one will ever believe my story. I hear crying coming from the corner of the room. She followed me here. I don't want to live anymore and I'm going to kill myself because of her. This will be the last time anyone hears from me as I write on in this hospital notepad. Goodbye everyone. I'm sorry but it's all her fault. That damn lady. The lady under the house. Thank you.